So in this chapter, we are going to be talking about the consequences of a theorem in topology about complete metric spaces uh, when applied in Banach spaces. So this is a theorem due to my great, great, great grandfather, mathematically speaking, so using the relationship of having a doctoral supervisor. That's René Louis Baer, and in his PhD thesis in 1899, uh, he proved this uh, theorem that we are going to prove in this video and that I will be describing in a minute. And then later on, we'll be describing the consequences of that theorem in Banach spaces. And these consequences are absolutely striking. It gives us uh, a lot of automatic improvement on certain properties. So we'll say the uniform boundedness principle, right? When you have a family of linear operators that are uniformly bounded point-wise than the uniformly bounded in the stronger uniform norm topology. When you have a set that is weakly bounded, then it's automatically strongly bounded. When you have a linear map that is invertible, a bounded linear map that is invertible, then the inverse also has to be automatically bounded and therefore continuous. So we have all these very nice improvements that are going to be very helpful in everything we do in Banach spaces. And they all come from the same source, this theorem of Baer about complete metric spaces. What does this theorem tell us? It tells us that if we have a family of open sets that are large in a topological sense, and large in a topological sense will be they are dense, right? They're closure is the entire space. Then even if you intersect all of them, even countably many of them, it doesn't matter. You're still very large. You're still dense in the entire space, right? So taking countable intersection, of large sets in a topological sets still give you a large set. Now you could take complements of all those sets and, and see an equivalent statement that tells you that if you take closed sets that are very small topologically, they have empty interior, then even taking a countable union of them is not gonna change the fact that you get something small. So the countable union will still have empty interior. Now, this is reminiscent of the fact that you know from measure theory that if you have sets of measure zero and you take a countable union of them, then you're still of measure zero. Now, being of measure zero is the measure theoretic way of saying that a set is small, whereas having empty interior is a topological way that uh, of saying that a set is small. It's interesting to note, by the way, that um, uh, measure theory was developed by Lebesgue just a few years after this result uh, of Baer, and I think they, they were very much influencing each other. So nowadays we have these two notions, topological notions and measure theoretic notions to say whether or not certain subsets are small or large. And this is large in a topological sense or small in a topological sense, whereas having full measure or measure zero is in a, in a measure theoretic sense. And when you have both a topological structure and a measure, uh, theoretic structure, then sometimes the two have compatibilities and sometimes they do not. Right, but here we are talking about topological aspect and we're going to start by proving the theorem of Baer. Okay, so let's prove the theorem. Uh, we give ourselves some open sets. Okay, and uh, we assume that they are all dense. And we form their intersection. Right. Now we want to show that G is dense. And what does that mean? Well, that means that for every omega uh, in X that is open, omega intersect G. Right. So let's take an open set omega. Okay, and I need to show that it does intersect G. Now, omega is open, so I can pick a x naught in omega and a number r naught, such that the ball centered at x naught of radius r naught is included in omega. That's because it is open. Right, now, omega uh, O1 is dense. Right, so it has to intersect that ball. So I can pick uh, an x1 that is in O1 and is also in the ball x0, uh, r0. 
but all one is open so you can pick not just a an element in that intersection but you can pick a entire ball so you can choose our one uh, positive but I'm actually going to choose it between 0 and R0 over 2 such that the entire ball dx1 r1 is included in all one intersected dx0 r0 right and that's possible because all one is open but then I can keep going and I can actually you know you can take r1 even smaller to make sure that the entire closure of the ball which will be included in the ball of double the radius open one uh, is uh, is in that intersection so we can keep going and inductively choose uh, a sequence of point xn and a sequence of radii rn such that, well, what? Such that the ball at xn of radius rn is always included in, um, in on intersected with the ball that we had defined just previously, xn minus one, rn minus one for all n. And in the meantime, I'm gonna choose rn such that rn, it's all in star, is uh, smaller than rn minus one over two, right? Just repeating the above procedure. So of course, inductively, we have that rn is going to be smaller than r0 divided by two to the n for all n. So the distance, you denoting by d the distance in my metric space, between xn and xn plus one uh, is always going to be smaller than r0 divided by two to the n uh, because my xn plus one is in the ball centered at xn of radius rn and rn is smaller than r0 divided by two n, that's for all n. Okay, but what is that telling me? It's really telling me that xn is Cauchy because therefore you can sum things up and you can say that for all n and m in n, we say n greater or equal to m, the distance between xn and xm has to be smaller than r0 times the sum k running between m and n of 2 to the minus k. So that makes xn a Cauchy sequence. Now that's where the completeness of course come in. And it's convergent because the metric space in which I'm working is complete. Now there exists an x in x such that xn, the distance of xn to x tends to zero as n goes to infinity. But what can I say about that x? I can say that for every n, because the balls are inside each other, uh, for every n, x belongs to b of xn rn closure. Uh, and uh, this is included in on intersected with, well, with the previous ball or with the ball before and so on and so forth, so intersected with b x naught r not and that is true for all n so x is inside the intersection of all the ons and also inside this ball which was inside g sorry inside omega so this is a point inside g intersected omega so g intersected omega is non-empty which concludes the proof of their theorem.